This is mentioned very clearly in Surah Al-Qasas. Musa is a child of Banu Israel. He's from the, from the uh, Israelites. All right, so he is from Banu Israel, but however, he's raised in the house of Fir'aun. All right, so he's raised in the house of Fir'aun amongst the people of Fir'aun. Now we know the story that he goes in the marketplace. There's a man from the people of Fir'aun, the Qibtiyun, who's having a who is in an argument with a man from Banu Israel, Musa's people. Now Musa is constantly struggling with this whole dilemma of a man of Banu Israel living amongst the king and his people. So when he sees this and the man from Banu Israel sees Musa and he knows Musa has got a soft spot for his people, Banu Israel. Musa, Musa, look what this guy's doing to me. So Musa salam intercedes, he steps in, says, what's going on here? Hey, what's going on here? The man says, hey, move along, mind your own business. Move along, mind your own business. Gets very rude and abrupt and starts getting aggressive, starts getting in Musa salam's face. You know, I would say somebody gets up in your grill, somebody gets up in your face. So you have no choice but to kind of defend yourself, push somebody off. So Musa does that, he says, back up buddy. But what ends up happening is the dude dies. Musa says, back up. And the man dies. Musa doesn't realize his own strength. The man's dead. Okay, now that's a very small, that's, that's an incident from his life, that's a detail. That's a detail, and this is before he became a prophet, this is long before that. But it's mentioned in the Qur'an. There's actually a lesson here. This is relevant, this is pertinent. And the relevance of this incident to the message here, is that Musa salam committed our unintentional, accidental, but nevertheless what was judged amongst the people where he lived in at that time to be a, a crime. A crime. He was a convicted criminal. Amongst, it, amongst the people. Unintentional, accidental, but nevertheless the people saw it as a crime. Okay? In his earlier age, he committed that crime. Later on in life, he is made a messenger of Allah. And then he's sent back to those same people to go and bring them the message from Allah. Go and deliver the divine message to them. Now, as soon as he's told that, what's the very first thing Musa... You know what's what, in the dialogue between Allah and Musa alayhi salam? One of the first things he says is, وَلَهُمْ عَلَيْهِ ذَنْبٌ وَلَهُمْ عَلَيْهِ ذَنْبٌ He even says, Allah, you're gonna send me back to Fir'aun and the people? I, I'm a criminal there. I owe them some form of retribution. I'm a criminal there. I'm wanted over there. You're sending me to them? Okay, so he's already hesitant because of that previous past crime. Allah says, no, you still gotta go. And when Musa salam walks into the court of Fir'aun, and says, I'm here with the message of Allah. You need to believe in one Allah. You need to let Banu Israel go. What's the very first thing Fir'aun says? Hey, aren't you that guy? Very sarcastically, aren't you the guy that did what you did back when you did it? And you were a really bad person? Right? Why are we? That's what he points out, right? So that worst fear is realized. So the, it contributes to the message in a deeper fashion and manner where there's a powerful lesson to be extracted. And that is, that's going to happen a lot. That's going to be a very common occurrence. That somebody previously, some point in time in their previous life, they will have done something bad. They will have done something not so admirable. They committed a crime, they did something bad. And not only did they do something bad, but the people will know that this person was the dude who did that. He's the guy who did that. They'll know that he was the one. And so he'll have that bad rep amongst his people. But somewhere down the line, there will be a major turning point in his life. Like in the life of Musa alayhi salam. He was never a bad person, but he had that one little incident in his past. And the major turning point, what I mean is he went from being a normal, ordinary individual, to being a messenger of Allah. So same way in our society, in our communities, there will be people sometime in the, pa in the past in their life, they will have done something bad. Then they'll have a turning point in their life, where they'll turn things around. And then they will come back wanting to do something good, wanting to contribute something, 
wanting to be a part of something good. And at that point in time, that's where this incident becomes very relevant. What are we going to do? Are we going to be like Fir'aun? So when that young man comes up to call the Adhan, and he was convicted of something, he did something bad, and he comes up to call the Adhan, it's like, hey, you? Get it. You? Move, move back, move back. I don't want you calling Adhan. You're a bad person. Right? Are we going to do that? Are we, because if we do that, if that is our behavior, if we're judging people the second they walk through the door, we're no better than Fir'aun. We have just exhibited an equality of Fir'aun. We're acting like Fir'aun, because that's what Fir'aun did. He didn't care what Musa alayhi salam had to say, he didn't care why he was coming, he didn't care who he had become and who he had matured into. All he was still stuck on was, yeah, but you're the guy who did that. He was still stuck on that. So what are we going to do? How are we going to react to people? So very, versus that, compare that to the example of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Did he ever, ever, ever hold anyone's past against them? Never did. Never did. Too many examples to list on here. Wahshi. Wahshi is the man who assassinated the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ. The death of the uncle, the murder of the uncle, the mutilation of the body of the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ is one of the moments in his life where the Sahaba say, we, it was one of the few times where we saw the Prophet ﷺ in such profound pain. Like he was crying. He was so deeply hurt. That when they walked back in, when they came back into Medina, it's the battle of Uhud, many Muslims had died on that day. And he could hear different family members crying when they were receiving the news of the death of their family member. The Prophet ﷺ started to cry as they were walking into Medina. And he started to say, today there is somebody crying for everyone who's died. But there's nobody crying for my uncle. Because my uncle's own family was the one who did this to him. That's how much pain he felt. But the man who carried out the assassination, the hit, on Hamza radiallahu anhu, Wahshi, not only does the Prophet ﷺ not hold a grudge against him, but the Prophet ﷺ is the one who is having letter after letter after letter sent to Wahshi, tell Wahshi to become Muslim, tell Wahshi to change his life, tell Wahshi that he should accept Islam, tell Wahshi that Allah will forgive him. That's how merciful the Prophet ﷺ was. That's how willing he was to overlook people's past. Hind, the woman who hired Wahshi to assassinate Hamza radiallahu anhu, and after he goes to her and he tells her the job is done, she, a woman, she goes down into the battlefield, she walks up to the dead body of Hamza lying there, she pulls out a dagger, she cuts his ears, his nose, and his tongue out. Strings them up and keeps them as a souvenir. This is a woman. She then takes the dagger, puts it in his body, rips his body open, pulls out his internal organs and mutilates his body. This is a woman. She takes his clothes and rips his clothes off and completely exposes his body. A woman who did this, that's how much he hated the Prophet And that's how horrible, what a horrible act she had done to the Prophet and his uncle. But on the day of Fatih Makkah, the Prophet doesn't do anything to her. And when she comes to the Prophet to accept Islam, Ahlan wa sahlan, marhaban bikum. He welcomes her, gives her the shahada, allows her to become Hind radiallahu anha a companion, a female companion of the Prophet ﷺ. And the stories go on and on. Ikrama, the son of Abu Jahl, same thing. Khalid ibn al-Walid, the architect of the killing of dozens of Muslims on the day of Uhud. All of these people, they were embraced with open arms. And they were made to be close to the Prophet ﷺ and he accepted them as they were. And that's not all, those are people that did something against him, even people who were just bad people in society. Umar radiallahu anhu, the Prophet ﷺ embraced him with open arms. So this is that behavior versus the behavior of Fir'aun. One, one little personal incident about what I mentioned, about people's past, a personal experience that I had. I was at, at, at a masjid where I was leading the prayer. And so it was during the daytime, I think it was Salat al-Asr. And the masjid is that, that busy. A young gentleman walked in, to the masjid to pray. Now, the gentleman was literally covered in tattoos. 
from his fingers up to his neck, completely covered in tattoos. And so, now obviously somebody like that walks into the masjid and what do we immediately do? Reach for your phone, right? Something bad's about to happen, right? So obviously people get nervous. So I, it was, we were actually walking in for the prayer, the iqamah was being called, I said, Salaamu Alaikum, he said, Wa Alaikum Salaam, we went in and we prayed. After Salah, I turned around, I said, hey, first time I had ever seen him there at the masjid, I said, Salaamu Alaikum, brother, never seen you before. See, I just moved to the area, just last week. And so I just found the masjid, I just got a job, I just found the masjid, and so I thought I'd come pray after work. And he was still in his work uniform. So I said, okay, mashallah, welcome. And so, then I started talking to him, where are you from? Where'd you grow up? What's your name? Started getting to know the brother. And he starts talking and talking and he starts telling me his story, kind of his story. And he says that he was, he's actually of, an, he's of Thai background. Eastern Asian, Thailand. His folks are from Thailand. He's of Thai background. And he says, tells me that his uncle was really caught up in the crime ring, uh, in a lot of drugs and a lot of crime where he grew up. In California, his uncle was caught up, he was like a gang leader, he was really, really bad, involved in a lot of horrible stuff. A lot of crime, a lot of bad stuff. He said growing up, his mother tried to shield him and protect him from that whole, uh, the whole family history there in the family situation, but he said that eventually he joined the family business. He said like around 14, dropped out of school, started you know, slinging drugs, selling drugs on corners, started committing crimes, started robbing people, drive-bys, the whole bit. Got involved in the whole scene. And he said, by the time I was 23 years old, I had already been to prison twice. Already been to prison twice, horrible life, just crime, crime, crime all the time. And he said, when I was 23 years old, I was arrested for the third time. Now in California, they have three strikes. And you're in jail for life, that's it, you're done. So he said, I was arrested for the third time, and he said, I was sitting in jail at night, the next morning I was going to be presented, I was going to be arraigned, presented before the judge. And he said, sitting there at night, I realized, this is my third strike. And he said, at that moment, it finally hit me, my life is over. My life is over. I'm 23, and my life is over. And he said, at that moment, it just sunk in. Because when you're caught up in that whole lifestyle, you don't think. He said, it sunk in. And it hit me. My life's over. So he said, at that moment, I just couldn't help myself. He said, in my cell, I fell into sujood. I did sajda. I put my face on the ground. And he said, he said, it was the first time in nearly 10 years that I had done sajda. The last time I had done sajda, when as I went, 10 years ago, when I went to the masjid with my mom. Since then, I hadn't even done such. I hadn't prayed for 10 years. He said, I did such. And at that moment, life changed. He said, I cried all night long. And I made dua to Allah. And he said, I said, oh Allah, I realize what I've done with my life. Give me another chance, another opportunity. I'll change my ways. And I'll, I, I will totally change my ways. And he said, at that moment, I felt like I needed to make an intention. What am I going to do? Allah, if you save me from this moment, what will I do with my life? And he said, I remember when I was a child, my mom always had one wish. And that was, I would become a hafiz of Qur'an. She said, oh, your grandfather was a hafiz, but your uncle went bad, and everybody in your uh, family didn't follow in your grandfather's footsteps. You should, I want you to be a hafiz and revive that tradition that your grandfather had, be a hafiz of Qur'an. And he said, I remembered that at that moment, because I'm thinking about Allah, I'm thinking about my mother and how much I hurt her. So I decide, I say, oh Allah, if I'm able to get out of here, I'm going to go and become a hafiz of Qur'an. I'm going to memorize Qur'an. He said when he's presented before the judge the next day, he said the judge looks at the file, looks at me, my mom sitting in the back of the courtroom crying her eyes out. I'm a young man. He said the judge looked at the file, closes the file, says stand up. He says, if I was to let you go right now, what would you do? And he said, it's funny you ask me that because last night I had a change of heart. I repented. And I'm going to change my life. And I'm going to go and I'm going to study my religion and study the Qur'an, the book of Allah. And I'm going to commit myself to being a good person. So the judge said, alright. Charges, case dismissed, get out of here. Be on your way. He said, I walked out of the courtroom. My mom is crying, can't believe that this happened. He said, I asked her, mom, how much money you got in your pocket? How much money you got in your purse? She pulled out 40, 50 bucks. My uncles were there. 
give me, give me whatever cash you got. He said, I got about a couple of hundred bucks. I said, somebody drive me to the bus stop right now. Drive me to the bus stop right now. He said he jumped on a bus, rode a bus to the nearest major Islamic center, found out where's their Quran memorization program. 23 year old man, just literally no clothes. He said, I had nothing. I went to an Islamic center and said, where can I go to memorize Quran? They said, oh, there's a uh, place, there's a school for Quran memorization that's 200 miles from here. It's in this and this city, this is the address. He said, I jumped on another bus on a Greyhound and I went to there. And I literally walked in the door and said, hi, my name is this, I want to memorize the Quran. <laughs> like, okay, come on in. The man tells me, he was 23 years old at the time. He memorized the entire Quran. This, this, guy, this man, young man didn't even know how to read Alif Ba Ta Tha. He started from scratch. He memorized the entire Quran cover to cover in eight months. Eight months he memorized the entire Quran. He's, I, I've had him lead prayer. I've heard him read. Beautiful recitation. Knows his Quran. And today, years later, a husband and a father. And his children, when you see his children, the adab, the character that they have, he himself personally is making his children memorize Qur'an. Amazing. People's past and what they can become.